Good morning and welcome to today's lecture. We have been discussing the thermal history of the universe and at the end of the last class we were discussing the possibility of the neutrino having a mass. So, let us resume that discussion and let me uh, remind you of what we were discussing. So, uh, we started off uh, by uh, noting the fact that uh, the uh, photon number density in the universe is 420 photons per centimeter cube at present and the number density scales as 1 plus z to the power 3. Then we remember that the neutrino number density is lower than the photon number density and since the neutrinos are fermions, uh, the number if the temperature were the same then the uh, number density of neutrinos would be uh, 3 fourth for every species every flavor of the neutrino the number density would be 3 fourth times the number density of photons if the temperature was same, but the temperature also is lower. So, finally, the number density of neutrinos is uh, 3 by 11th of the number density of photons. So, in addition to the photon background we also have a neutrino background and each flavor of neutrino has a number density of approximately 113 into 10 to the power 6 per meter particles per meter cube and the whole thing scales as 1 plus z to the power 3. So, given this uh, number density of neutrinos which is present in the universe, we were considering the possibility that one of the neutrino flavors one of the neutrinos has a mass. So, one flavor of a neutrino has a mass. This is the assumption uh, is that, that we had made and uh, uh, we had also assumed that the mass is much smaller than the temperature scale where the neutrinos decouple. So, the temperature scale where the neutrinos decouple we had seen is around 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. So, if you convert this to a mass scale multiplied by the Boltzmann constant this will give you energy divided by c square it will give you a mass scale. So, the mass of the neutrino is assumed to be much smaller than this number. If this holds then the fact that the neutrino has a mass may be completely ignored at the time where the neutrinos decoupled from the rest of the components of the universe. So, at the time of de decoupling the neutrinos the number density of neutrinos would be exactly the same as uh, this uh, except that the redshift would be different. <coughs> and with the expansion of the universe the number density would scale the, <coughs> the phase space distribution of neutrino would be frozen and uh, all that would happen is that all the moment each momentum would uh, scale would go down inversely with the expansion of the universe we have studied this. So, for once the neutrinos decouple all that ha happens is that the neutrinos free stream and uh, the uh, density in phase space uh, is uh, frozen and each momentum <coughs> essentially scales as 1 by a and uh, <coughs> so that is what would happen. <coughs> now, the mass that we have considered uh, although it is much smaller than the energy scale 10 to the power 10 Kelvin we have assumed that it is mass it is more than the energy scale at present and so it is more than the, energy, the present energy scale this should actually be the neutrino temperature which is somewhat lower, but it really does not matter. So, we are assuming that the mass is more than the uh, present energy scale. So, the neutrino becomes the mass of the neutrino manifests itself uh, sometime in the uh, uh, as the universe expands and at present we assume that the neutrino is the rest mass energy of the neutrino is much larger than the, uh, the kinetic energy. So, at present the neutrino is a non relativistic particle its energy is dominated by the rest mass and so, since the energy is dominated by the rest mass 
we can calculate the mass density of the neutrino also. It is just the mass of each particle into the number density of particles. So, this is the mass density of that massive neutrino species at present which is predicted for such a neutrino. And these particles their random motion is also going to be the negligible. They are essentially the energy is dominated by the rest mass. So, they do not contribute significantly to the pressure you can think of them as pressureless dust which we have encountered earlier. <clears throat> so, this is the consequence of there being one, uh, one neutrino flavor which has got a mass. So, you will have a neutrino density like this it predicts that the universe will now have a neutrino density a density a matter component which has density given by this. Now, let us ask the question is such is there any observation that seems that are any is are there any observational constraints on this. Can the universe have be at present can there be such a matter density in the universe coming from neutrinos. Well, there are observations which some of which we have discussed and some which we have not, but these observations tell us that the uh, matter content of the universe omega matter naught is of the order of unity or, or less basically. So, it would be more appropriate to put a So, the matter content of the universe at present is predicted to be less than the density parameter of matter at present is predicted to be less than 1. We have seen that there is dark energy etcetera. So, there are observations. Uh, so, uh, from the expansion of the universe and various other observations which indicate that the density parameter of matter in the universe at present is less than or equal to 1, which essentially tells us that if one species, one flavor of neutrino is massive, then the density of that neutrino should be less than equal to the critical density of the universe or we can say that this should be equal to uh, rho critical naught into omega matter naught. And uh, the critical density of the, so we have worked out what this would be in terms of the neutrino mass what this essentially tells us that the neutrino mass m nu into uh, 113 into 10 to the power 6 <coughs> meter minus 3 should be less than equal to the critical density of the universe the, the present value of the critical density of the universe is uh, 1 point we know that the critical the critical value is 3 of the density uh, is 3 h naught square by 8 pi g. And uh, if you write h naught in terms of 100 small h kilometers per second per mega parsec, then the value then what this gives you is that the critical density at present is uh, 1.88 into 10 to the power <coughs> minus 26 kg h square this h square comes from here kg per meter cube that is the uh, critical density. So, the density of neutrinos coming from the neutrinos should be less than the matter density universe. So, the matter density is the critical density into omega matter naught. Uh, so, what it tells us is that m nu the mass of the neutrino should be less than equal to. So, we can divide this 
by 113 into 10 to the power 6 to get a limit on the mass of the neutrino and what it tells us is that uh, <coughs> this should be less than 1.7 into 10 to the power minus 33 <coughs> 10 to the power minus uh, 34 sorry kg into omega baryon 8 square. So, uh, <coughs> this is the uh, constraint that we get on the mass of the neutrino. It is uh, <coughs> more uh, meaningful to express this in terms of electron volts. So, uh, what we have to do is we have to multiply uh, this by convert this into energy multiplied by c square. So, we have to multiply to convert to E v electron volts, we have to multiply uh, into C square by E that is what you have to do. So, the limit that you get if you do this is that the mass of the neutrino <coughs> should be less than <coughs> or <coughs> equal to 94 <coughs> electron volt omega matter not h square. So, uh, this is the limit that you get on the neutrino mass from the as a uh, limit from the fact that the mass uh, density parameter of the mass of the universe should be less than or equal to 1. From, so, from the fact that the, uh, from the fact that you know the you can determine the mass parameter of the universe. So, the mass of the any neutrino if it if, if one of the neutrino species is mass flavors is massive the mass should be uh, less than 94 electron volts of the order of 94 electron volts. This uh, so the uh, basically what we find is that uh, observations cosmological observations of the expansion rate of the universe and uh, the large scale structures can put limits on the masses of fundamental particles in this case the mass of the neutrino. And this uh, very interesting limit this very interesting idea was first worked out by uh, in 1972 by uh, Kausik and McClelland. And when it was uh, initially worked out, this was uh, one of the most uh, sensitive, most stringent limits on neutrino mass. Now, let us ask the question you see uh, what happens if uh, there one of the neutrinos is a uh, species is actually massive. So, if one of the neutrino species is actually massive then we have uh, the, the whole universe is uh, filled at present filled with these massive weakly interacting particles. Which are also referred to as WIMP. So, these are particles which do not interact with uh, with photons and interact weakly with electrons and baryons. So, 
these such particles would essentially be only be uh, the only visible manifestation of such a particle would be through the gravitational force gravitational interaction the gravitational field the gravitational interaction produced by such particles would be just like any other particle but these particles would not emit light uh, they would not interact with photons and they would only interact very weakly with electrons and protons and neutrons <coughs> So, these such if we had such a sea of such particles floating around which would happen if one of the neutrinos would were massive this would be what a very good candidate for what is called dark matter. And we have already seen discussed one evidence for dark matter that is the rotation curve of galaxies and <coughs> there are a variety of other observational evidences which indicate that the universe at present is uh, has a large component of the matter in the universe is at present made up of this dark kind of matter which is dark matter. So, the question arises is our neutrinos the dark matter that we have in the universe. I have told you that and there is evidence that around 25 percent of the matter of the constituents of the universe are dark matter. So, the question natural question that arises is that are the neutrinos are massive neutrinos uh, dark matter candidates. Well, let us see what this is the limit that we have using the uh, kind of arguments which were given in 1972. Let us now briefly very briefly just look at the current uh, current situation. So, let us ask the question what are the limits on the current limits on the neutrino mass. Well, the first point that I should uh, tell you is that uh, there now are very stringent limits on the neutrino mass, very stringent limits are I, are, which are imposed by various other kinds of experiments and observations. So, let me briefly just tell you about some of these. So, the first uh, limit, the first kind of limit comes from observations of uh, neutrino oscillations. <coughs> so, uh, observations of neutrino oscillations and uh, neutrino oscillations are observed in neutrinos uh, coming from the sun. So, solar neutrinos nucleus uh, then from nuclear reaction nuclear reactors and from cosmic ray showers. So, what are these neutrino oscillations? Well, I have told you that there are uh, three different uh, flavors of neutrinos. So, these are the electron neutrino and the mu neutrino and the tau neutrino. So, what happens in neutrino oscillations is that as the neutrino propagate they if you start off with electron neutrinos it will slowly become mu neutrino and maybe tau neutrino and then again come back to electron neutrino. So, the neutrino oscillates between these three flavors and the measurement of neutrino oscillations these oscillations have been measured from neutrinos coming from the in neutrinos coming from the sun in neutrinos coming from nuclear reactors 
and also in neut neutrinos coming from cosmic ray showers. And uh, <coughs> these neutrinos, the, the observation of these oscillations impose limits on the mass difference. between the mass states of the neutrinos which have well defined mass between neutrinos states with well defined mass and these states with well defined mass do not correspond to the electron mu and tau neutrino which is why we have oscillations between these as the neutrino oscillates and uh, what this uh, so let us call give it a name let us call it delta m square so what it tells us is that uh, so these mass uh, these neutrino oscillations tell us that the mass difference between these states is has the values so there are two values two limits so one is 8.0 uh, minus 0 0.4 these are experimental uh, limits error uh, error bars and uh, rather uh, plus uh, minus 0.4 uh, plus 0 0.4 and uh, minus 0 0.3 into 10 to the power uh, minus 5. So, uh, this is one limit and the other limit is uh, 10 to the power uh, that the mass difference should lie in the range minus 1.9, 1.9 into 10 to the power minus 3 to uh, 3 into 10 to the power minus 3. Uh, these are all in uh, electron volts square. So, there are three uh, different states uh, which, call, which have definite mass and the difference in ma the mass square between these th three states, one of them is known to be uh, 8 electron volt square, other one is in this range. So, these limits tell us that the mass difference <coughs> between the neutrinos difference between neutrinos is extremely small. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there is no reason the mass the mass difference between different neutrino states is extremely small and one believes that the masses themselves also are extremely small less than uh, 1 electron volt. So, of the order of maybe uh, if at all there are masses these, these put limits that they should be quite small less than electron volts. So, th this implies this is interpreted as telling us that the masses neutrino masses also are extremely small. The other possibility <coughs> is that the masses are not small, but they have an extremely small mass difference. So, even if the neutrino has a mass, uh, one neutrino has a mass let us say uh, 1 eV or so, then the other one will have a mass which is very close to this, because uh, the difference in the mass square is of this order 10 to the power minus 5. So, if, if the neutrino, if one of the neutrino has a mass, then all three of them must have nearly equal masses that is what it tells us and the most natural interpretation is that all of them have 0 mass or extremely small mass. So, this is one of the uh, most stringent uh, kind of inputs that we have on the neutrino masses. Then the uh, second input which uh, I can uh, tell you about is that there are absence of no anomaly anomalies. in the beta decay 
in the decay of tritium, in the beta decay of tritium. This uh, <coughs> imposes the limit that the neutrino mass uh, should be less than 2 electron volts. The third limit which I can tell you about <coughs> is uh, also co again cosmological, <coughs> though these the two which we just talked about are uh, first one. This also <coughs> involves uh, some amount of uh, astrophysics, the solar neutrinos and the cosmic ray showers. This is purely uh, uh, terrestrial. The third <coughs> is uh, from the anisotropies. in the cosmic microwave background radiation CMBR and <coughs> this imposes the limit that uh, the sum of the neutrino masses. <coughs> so, we know that there are three flavors. So, the uh, sum of the neutrino masses should be uh, less than uh, 0 0.6 uh, uh, 6 uh, electron volt and this is at the 95 percent confidence level. So, at 95 percent confidence the sum of the neutrino masses should be less than 0 0.66 electron volts and we just saw arguments why uh, the uh, if the neutrinos are massive then all three of them must have nearly equal mass because the mass differences have been measured and they are extremely small. So, this imposes a, a limit that the mass of a single species should be uh, less than 0 0.22 electron volt. So, all of these uh, together uh, seem to indicate that uh, the neutrinos that we have been discussing are not the uh, dark matter that is uh, so, uh, they do not con contribute very significantly to the dark matter that is the uh, uh, so, the mass limits uh, current mass limits and various other uh, uh, observation limits uh, seem to indicate that these neutrinos that we have been talking about <coughs> are not the dark matter that we see whether the dark matter that we see are not neutrinos, <coughs> not the kind of neutrinos which we have been talking about. There is another mass window which is, uh, corresponds to very extremely high mass neutrinos which could be a, a dark matter candidate, but that does not fall within the purview of these uh, three kind of neutrinos which we have been uh, talking about. So, uh, let me bring this uh, topic uh, to a close over here. The, so, till now what we have been discussing is the possibility that the neutrinos have mass and we saw that astrophysical observations uh, provide quite stringent limits on the neutrino mass which also indicate that the kinds of neutrinos which we have been talking about which decouple from the CMBR at a temperature of around 10 to the power 10 Kelvin which were in thermal equilibrium before that these neutrinos are most probably not the dark matter that we see around us. <coughs> Okay. So, the question what is the dark matter, what, what is the dark matter really made up of is still an open question and uh, let us now move on to something else. So, the uh, <coughs> till now our discussion has mainly the, of the thermal history has mainly focused on the photons and the, uh, then we considered the electron positron annihilation and uh, the neutrinos. Let us now also discuss what happens to the small amount of baryons, nucleons that is present and this brings us to the very interesting topic which is uh, the topic of big uh, bang nucleosynthesis. <coughs> big bang nu Cleo synthesis. So, 
so what we are discussing now is the uh, <coughs> small amount <coughs> of uh, neutrons and protons which are the uh, strongly interacting particles uh, the nucleons we shall sometime refer to them as nucleons and uh, sometime as baryons <coughs> which are present in the universe at uh, temperatures of around uh, <coughs> 10 to the power 10. So, we have seen that uh, 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 4 and higher even higher than 10 to the power 10. These particles do not play a very significant role in the dynamics of the universe. The dynamics of the universe is mainly governed by the neutrinos and the photons which are relativistic particles. These particles have become non-relativistic and they do not play a very important role in the dynamics of the universe. And we have essentially ignored these particles till now and we have worked out the uh, the e equations that govern the dynamics of the universe in this epoch. We shall come back to this <coughs> shortly. Now, let us ask the question what happens to the uh, neutrons and protons uh, the nucleons in this epoch. Now, uh, in this we know that there are several uh, reactions which uh, can convert neutrons and protons. So, these reactions let me uh, outline these reactions. Uh, these reactions let me move on to another sheet of paper. So, these uh, reactions are uh, neutron the neutron can uh, interact with an electron positron to form a proton and a anti neutrino <coughs> this is the first reaction the second reaction is that a proton <coughs> sorry a neutron <coughs> can uh, <coughs> interact with a neutrino to form a proton and an electron <coughs> and a third the third reaction is that the neutron can go over to a proton and a positron sorry an electron and an anti neutrino so, all of these uh, three reactions essentially can convert a neutron to a proton and a proton to a neutron and at sufficiently high temperatures and densities uh, these reactions are in thermal equilibrium. Now, uh, at the temperatures that we are interested in of the order of 10 to the power 10 Kelvin the neutrons and protons are essentially at rest the temperature is smaller than the rest mass of the neutrons and protons they are essentially at rest and uh, the uh, the binding the the mass difference q between these two is uh, essentially uh, the difference the neutron has a larger mass than the proton and uh, this has a value of uh, 1. Point, uh, Two eight uh, two nine three MeV, and uh, we can. It is also useful to write this in terms of a temperature. So uh, what we can do is uh, one point two nine three into this is in MeV into ten to the power six into the charge uh, into the charge of the uh, electron which is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 and divided by the Boltzmann constant which is 1.38 into 10 to the power minus 23 
and it gives us the temperature scale which is uh, 1.5 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. So, the um, energy difference between the, the mass difference between the proton and the neutron, the corresponding temperature corresponding to the scale is uh, of the order of 1.5 into 10 to the power 10, which is somewhere in the range that we are talking about. Now, uh, if these reactions are in thermal equilibrium, then the uh, then the ratio in thermal equilibrium in thermal equilibrium the ratio x n by x p is equal to e to the power minus the mass energy difference between the neutron and the proton which is uh, we have seen 1.293 mega electron volts divided by kvt <coughs> which uh, also tells us that the uh, so now here let me just tell you what xn and xp are xn for example is the fraction of nucleons in neutrons. Similarly, x p is the fraction of uh, nucleons in protons. And at sufficiently high temperatures of, of the order of 10 to the power 10, these are the only two kinds of particles that we have and the total sum is 1, which is why we can write it in this way. And uh, we can then eliminate, uh, we can solve this in thermal equilibrium, we can solve this and it gives us that x n, the, uh, the neutron uh, fraction is uh, 1 by 1 plus exponential q by k b t. <coughs> now, <coughs> we have discussed already that uh, to determine if these uh, reactions are in uh, thermal equilibrium or not, we have to look at the reaction rates and compare them with the rate of uh, expansion the Hubble parameter at this epoch and uh, we have already calculated the uh, Hubble parameter uh, if you remember we can use this to calculate the Hubble parameter which we have done in the last class during the epoch where uh, the temperature is 10 to the power 10 and uh, so one can these are all uh, weak interactions so one can the, the reaction rates can be calculated if one knows how to calculate the weak interaction reaction rates. And uh, uh, these detailed calculations uh, they show that uh, the, uh, these reactions remain in thermal equilibrium till a temperature of uh, 3 times ten to the power 10 Kelvin. So, this, uh, these calculations of the weak interaction uh, reaction rates, they essentially tell us that uh, this, this formula, the neutron fraction can be calculated using this formula till a uh, temperature, till the universe has a temperature of 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin and uh, the corresponding age of the universe can be calculated using this. And uh, to just uh, give you uh, the uh, feel for the numbers, a detailed uh, calculation of the uh, reaction rates uh, tells us 
that uh, at a temperature of 3 into 10 to the power 10 numerical calculations, the uh, age of the universe uh, is uh, 0 0.1106. Seconds and uh, the uh, neutron fraction Xn is equal to uh, zero point three uh, seven nine eight, which is a uh, very close. to uh, thermal equilibrium value, which you would get if you were to substitute 3 into 10 to the power 10 over here. So, uh, so uh, at 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, uh, the uh, reaction rates are uh, sufficiently high for thermal reaction. Uh, for uh, for thermal equilibrium to hold, but at temperatures below this, uh, the uh, at T less than uh, three into ten to the power ten, what happens is that uh, at around uh, the densities fall, further the uh, neutrinos decouple. So, once the neutrinos decouple, you uh, they do not interact much with anything else after that the neutrino cross section falls and uh, these reactions uh, these reactions where proton gets converted into uh, neutron or the neutron uh, scatters with the uh, neutrino to form a proton and an electron these uh, no longer take place. So, this occurs decouples at around 10 to the power 10 Kelvin and we also remember that around uh, uh, that the electron positron annihilate at around uh, 5 into 10 to the power 9 Kelvin. So, further there are no the the electron density also falls and the electron positron density falls. So, these reactions also get suppressed and uh, so these uh, the these reactions all stop by and large the uh, only reaction that continues to happen uh, beyond this is that uh, is this uh, reaction where uh, the neutrinos get converted into protons and uh, let's so let me write it down the the reaction that continues to occur is that the neutrinos they go over to proton uh, plus and electron plus the anti neutrino. <coughs> so, we know that the neutrino the neutron is an unstable particle a free neutron is an unstable particle. So, it essentially uh, once it goes out of equilibrium the only reaction that proceeds is that the free neutrons they uh, decay to form the proton uh, uh, electron and the uh, uh, and the anti neutrino. And uh, this is all that occurs once uh, uh, once the uh, the reaction goes out of equilibrium. So once you cross ten to the power uh, three into ten to the power ten Kelvin, once you cross this three into ten to the power ten Kelvin, uh, essentially the neutrino neutrons all decay and uh, give uh, can get converted into protons. So, this is the uh, basic thing and uh, this reaction has a lifetime which I denote here by tau n of uh, 885 point 0.7 plus minus 0 0.9 seconds. So, uh, this is the uh, lifetime of uh, this neutri neutron uh, once it goes out of thermal equilibrium. So, this uh, free neutron essentially uh, decays with this lifetime and uh, the uh, 
neutron uh, fraction x n in this epoch uh, is can be well described uh, by 0 by this uh, 0 0.1609 into exponential minus tau by tau n. So, uh, this is what happens. So, uh, uh, once the neutrinos, uh, once the, uh, the, the thermal equilibrium is gone, the neutron fraction, uh, the neutrons decay to form protons and the neutron fraction falls exponentially with time with this uh, uh, with the uh, lifetime mean lifetime being given by this. And uh, just to give you a feel for the numbers, remember that uh, we had a uh, that we had a mass uh, <coughs> we had a neutron uh, fraction of around uh, 0 0.38 uh, at 3 into 10 to the power 10 when thermal equilibrium was uh, was last there and by a temperature of uh, 10 to the power 10 to the power 9 uh, the uh, neutron fraction uh, falls to uh, 0 0.133, which again is uh, very close to check this I should give you the uh, the age of the universe over here and uh, the age of the universe uh, here is uh, 168.1 seconds at, at this uh, temperature. So, these are from new detailed numerical calculations of these uh, reactions putting in all the uh, putting in all the nuclear a weak interaction rates, etcetera, and it is uh, very uh, close to this uh, exponential decay once the uh, neutrons uh, decouple. So, let me uh, recapitulate uh, what we just learnt about the uh, behavior of this uh, of the baryon species. Uh, so, there is an epoch where they are in thermal equilibrium and uh, this is at high temperatures and in this epoch the uh, the neutron fraction is well described by this formula where they are in thermal equilibrium and uh, this uh, I have also told you the value over here. So, one can use this to calculate uh, the neutron fraction in all the way till 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin and beyond that once you cross that value where they are no longer in thermal equilibrium all that happens is that the neutrons they decay to give protons electrons and anti neutrinos and in this regime so this is t less than 3 into 10 to the power 10 kelvin this is t greater than equal to 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, neutron fraction decays exponentially and uh, it uh, forms uh, uh, forms the uh, protons. Now, uh, given this background about what happens to the uh, neutrons and protons uh, in this uh, expanding uh, background. Let us now ask the question about uh, address the issue of the formation of other elements heavier than these particles uh, during this these epochs that we have been discussing. So, uh, the basic idea is that uh, is a reaction of uh, this kind. Uh, so, the question that first of all the question that we are going to ask is that can the neutron and positron fuse to form heavier elements. 
heavier nuclei. So essentially, uh, in a nutshell, the, uh, the kind of uh, reaction that we are interested in is that is like this. So uh, So uh, what happens, the kind of uh, process that we are interested in, the question we are asking is that uh, Z protons and A minus Z neutrons, they fuse, they combine to form uh, some element, some nuclei, the, the nuclei of some heavy element which has got atomic mass number A. and uh, atomic number Z. So uh, th this is the question that we are asking. So Z protons and A minus Z neutrons, they fuse, they combine to form an element, the nuclei or nucleus of an element with the uh, mass number, atomic mass number A and uh, uh, atomic number F. So this is the uh, process that we are interested in. Uh, we will uh, take up in, in the next class. We shall uh, see the uh, consider the possibility that the neutrons and protons fuse together to form heavier elements of atomic mass number A and uh, atomic number Z. So let me uh, uh, just briefly recapitulate what we have done in uh, today today's lecture and uh, stop after that. So in today's lecture, we first uh, considered the possibility that neutrinos have mass and uh, after that we worked out the predicted mass density then and uh, we saw that the uh, just the expansion of the universe puts limits on the neutrino mass. After that, we addressed the question and if one of the neutrinos does have mass, it will be a very uh, promising dark matter candidate. But after that I showed you that there are very stringent limits now which uh, more or less indicate that the kind of neutrinos which we are discussing are not uh, the dark matter candidates. After that we shifted our attention to another very interesting issue. This is big bang nucleosynthesis. The essential question is that we know for heavy nuclei to be synthesized, we need a very hot and dense environment. The early universe which we have been discussing provides us with such an environment. So the question we are addressing is what kind of nuclei can be synthesized in the early universe. And we started off with the discussing the residual protons and neutrons and uh, we saw that these will be in thermal equilibrium till, a, till the universe is hotter than 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin. Once the universe cools below 3 into 10 to the power 10 Kelvin, the neutrons will decay exponentially and I showed you how we can calculate the neutron fraction before this that is before 3 into 10 to the power 10 at temperatures hotter than 3 into 10 to the power 10 and at temperatures cooler than 3 into 10 to the power 10. So let me stop here. In the next class, we shall continue our discussion on the Big Bang nucleosynthesis.